My name is Amanda. I'm the president of the Dysautonomia Support Network. I'm here today to talk about uh, prepping for perioperative success. Many of us have many surgeries. Um, some of them are um, planned, some unplanned. So this is more focused on planned surgeries, ones that we can prepare for, and how to do the best job of uh, preparing for surgery and um, setting yourselves up to have the best outcome. I, for the last 10 years now, um, I've been a nurse for 25 years. I'm not sure how that happened because I'm only 26, but um, I've pulled it off somehow. And um, the last 10 years or so, I've been focused in a perioperative setting and endoscopy. And um, I spent a lot of time doing this. I still work part-time um, in, in the office mostly now because of my cervical bling and um, my bad back. But um, so I, I talk to patients a lot and, and I teach patients really how to um, approach surgery and help people understand the things that they're afraid of um, so we can reduce anxiety and have the best outcome. So I'm here today to help us because we are special and we do have some special considerations, educate ourselves and teach us how to educate our team and move strategically. Um, so we uh, really do have good outcomes and we make the best choices for ourselves. So what does perioperative mean? So I say that a lot, I'm a perioperative nurse. What does that mean? So I'm involved in the surgical process. Um, I assist the surgeons, I assist the anesthesia team, um, and perioperative care is the care that's given before and after surgery um, and around the intraoperative period that means during surgery. Um, this includes um, surgery that happens in the hospital or at an outpatient surgical center and um, the perioperative period extends from the day of surgery or before surgery when you're preparing for surgery and into the post-operative uh, recovery period. In my area, we call um, that PACU. We, you know, we call ourselves PACU nurses, but it may be different language depending on where you live in the country. So um, proper perioperative management helps to prevent or minimize comp complications and reduce post-operative pain. It also helps to accelerate recovery and can give you a better outcome. Many people don't understand who the surgical team is. So a lot of this information you're gonna get first is just basic understanding for the general population. And we'll talk a little bit more of why we're special in a little while. But the surgical team um, consists of more than just the surgeon. And this is a, a, a interesting um, misunderstanding. People don't understand the importance of the anesthesiologist and their role, um, and they, it's an afterthought. So the day of the surgery, the anesthesi anesthesiologist will walk up to the patient and they're like, who is this guy? You know, why is he asking me all these questions? And it's, it's something that people don't understand, and it's a very, they play a very important role. Um, the surgeon is uh, important, and choosing the right surgeon is a, a very important decision that you're going to make, but your anesthesiologist you have less control over. And so often you don't meet them until the morning you're going into surgery, maybe an hour before um, you're under their care. And that's a little stressful. Um, more importantly, you want to make sure that you're in a place that has an anesthesiologist. So as um, insurance companies make more of our choices for us about where we do have surgery and where they'll reimburse surgery. More people are directed to outpatient surgical centers. Um, I currently work um, for uh, an outpatient surgical center that is the second oldest in the country and we have a full anesthesia team. Um, we have the same team that rotates through the hospital because we're part of a hospital system. That is not the case in all outpatient centers. Some patient centers, outpatient centers um, do not have an anesthesiologist in the building. And you'll have um, RNs or CRNAs um, getting anesthesia, or sometimes a doctor will do it um, that is not trained in anesthesia. So these are important questions to ask and know before you book your surgery. Because with our patient population, we just tend to run into more complications and um, People don't think, in my experience, to ask these questions until um, the 11th hour. So just understanding and knowing that, and knowing if your anesthesia team um, has experience in dealing with people with disorders such as ours is an important thing to, to know. 
it's a very important role, anesthesiology. Um, they're very smart people, and I have a lot of respect for them. I work with them a lot. But um, knowing who's giving you the anesthesia and knowing that there's a, an, a doctor, an anesthesiologist in the building is important for us. Um, CRNAs are also amazing, and I have a lot of respect for them as well. Um, but you want to have a team in the building. If there's a problem, you don't want one person there trying to handle it by themselves. Um, so just be aware and ask questions before. Um, prepping for success. I can't see my speaker notes, so I'm going to wing it. Bear with me here. Um, so prepping for success is really important. Um, knowing your surgical team, and there's a lot that we can do to make sure that um, we really ensure our, that we are um, doing everything that we can to I'm having a little trouble with this. Bear with me one second. Okay, that we get the best care possible. So the pre-op interview, um, most places will either have you come in to meet with a pre-op nurse or they'll do an interview over the phone. Um, and the goal of this interview is to review your medical and surgical history, collect allergy information, um, and find information out about your general fitness, uh, functional status, your health, review your medication history, develop a plan for medication um, adjustments that need to be made before and after surgery. So there's a lot of medications and herbal supplements um, that you will need to stop um, for certain periods of time, and it will vary depending on the supplement or the medication before surgery. Some things prolong your bleeding time, um, and people often underreport these things. Um, we tend to use a lot of um, herbal supplements and things in our population. Even um, high doses of vitamin C, um, high doses of vitamin D, things like that can actually prolong your bleeding time. Um, so if you're on a lot of supplements and, and things that can combine and a baby aspirin, those things together um, should be addressed. So you want to tell your perioperative nurse or whoever is doing this assessment on you everything that you take. Don't skip things. Um, talk about your eye drops. Tell them about your inhalers. These are the common things that people forget. Um, you want to talk about your functional status, so where you are at that time. A lot of people will say, oh, I, you know, I was on the football team 12 years ago. Yeah, I can run three miles. That was 12 years ago. Then they show up and they can't climb a flight of stairs. So you want to talk about where you're at today, what you're able to do today. And that lets us better understand, you know, how your lung and heart function um, stand at that moment. So um, we determine sometimes what kind of testing we order and just making sure that you're safe. Everything that they're asking you is really determining your risk factors and what type of information and testing we need to order to make sure that you're going to have the safest, safest experience necessary. Um, so we want to know about comorbid conditions and um, all this really goes into this big picture of um, making sure that you're safe and appropriate and if, especially if you're going to an outpatient facility are you appropriate to be done there because they may not have all the equipment on hand in an outpatient facility that the hospital does so we want to make sure that we have it in the building and if we think that you might need to spend the night um, we want to make sure that you're moved to the hospital so that we don't have to then transport you and make it more of a process than it needs to be. So this is all set up to take um, the best care of you that's possible. So you want to always alert the team if you have a, a family history, and I'm sorry about these words, I didn't make them up, um, of malignant hyperthermia or pseudocolonesterase deficiency. So these are usually genetic in nature. Um, malignant hyperthermia is this adverse reaction that people have um, to anesthesia. And um, if this runs in your family, usually you will know about it, or you will have heard a story about Uncle John who went to the dentist and didn't do well when they put him to sleep. You know, you'll, you'll hear these stories. They're pretty dramatic, and uh, people don't do well. So if you have heard somebody in your family talk about somebody uh, having a, a near-death experience because of the anesthesia or something bizarre, you always tell the nurse or uh, the person doing your pre-op pre screening about this. 
um, because this is really important information. Pseudocholinesterase deficiency, um, in our population, I don't know that it's a trend. Um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients have a trend with pseudocholinesterase deficiency. Um, I know that a lot of us, um, I just see trends in our community, don't tolerate muscle relaxers well, um, and this is basically a prolonged paralysis kind of a reaction to muscle relaxers. So if you're one of those people, I would just mention it. It doesn't mean you have pseudocholinesterase deficiency. I would just let them know that you have a sensitivity to muscle relaxers. Um, so these are things to report. And if you've ever had an adverse reaction, if you're a, a vomiter, um, if you get nauseous, let us know. We have strategies to be proactive in the way we give you anesthesia. So these are general pre-op tips. Um, this is a longer presentation that I'm trying to scale down, so I'm not gonna go through every single thing, but the highlights show up on time. Show up on time, it's really important. Um, surgery waits for nobody, and um, it's really important to get good care. You need to be on time and let people do their jobs effectively. Don't um, rush the surgeons and the anesthesiologists. Be there and be present. Be, don't be on your phone. Nobody. You know, nobody wants to compete for your attention when you're there for surgery. Wear loose, comfortable clothing. Be aware of what you wear because when you leave, if you're there for yeah, a shoulder surgery, don't wear a, a, you know, a pull on top. So be thoughtful and mindful of how you get dressed when you get home and bring only one or two family members. When, they, when people come in with a squad of people, it's disruptive to everybody. It's not helpful. One or two calm, supportive family members. Don't bring, you know, the drama llama from your family with you, okay? <laughs> Leave them at home and give them text updates. That's what you do with them. Um, you don't need that. You need to be calm. The best time, if you can schedule your surgery, the best time to do it is the day after vacation. We want you there, like, chilled and zen, right? That's the be you're gonna have the best recovery that way. We want you there calm and cool. Bring one strategically packed overnight bag. If you know you're staying overnight, or if you think you might, if you're like me, and they love me so much when I have outpatient surgery, I spend the night because my blood pressure won't stabilize, and I, I bought them out. And so it takes them a day or two, and I know this. So I just pack a bag, I leave it in the car, I don't tell anybody. It's not a big deal. My husband goes and gets a bag, and I spend the night or two. So just be, you know, be aware. And um, take care of advanced directives and legal, legal paperwork and that good stuff. We should all be doing that now, right? That's the, the smart thing to do. But if you haven't done it, do it a month or two before. Don't do it the week before. You don't want to think about that stuff the week before. It's going to make you more anxious. Get it out of the way and then send a copy to your providers, including the place that you're having surgery, a month ahead. That's not something you want to be dealing with or being thinking about a week before surgery. And anyway, you're going to be on vacation. So. Who wants to deal with that? So tell the surgical team, again, about the over-the-counter meds, all that good stuff. And then one tip I tell people with brain fog, ADD, when I take the medical history, if I have people like this, um, and we get a lot of patients like me now because uh, we're doing more surgeries in my area, and they come to our center because they know I work there. Um, so the anesthesia team will say, we have another one of you, Amanda, coming in. Um, so I tell them, use your settings on your phone to remember to stop this medication. Program it in your phone. Use technology to help you because it can be a lot to remember. When to stop this, when to stop that. So put it in your phone, okay? Your physical health and your mental health, you need to strengthen them and um, protect them before surgery. Okay, so stay away from large crowds three days before surgery. Don't fly in a plane. So when you go on vacation, you're gonna drive. Um, you don't want to pick anything up on the plane. And um, make sure that like, you're not going through any stressful situation when you're, when you're doing uh, uh, or setting up a surgery that's, that is um, elective. So you don't want to be in the middle of a divorce. Uh, you don't want to have your body in a very stressed state because you're not going to heal as well. Um, you want your body as calm. And if your chronic pain, as we all have it, is really unmanaged, it's not an ideal time. You want to really focus on getting your chronic pain well managed before you put your body through the stress of surgery. Because you can get into this kind of um, cycle with pain and um, 
nerves and receptors that can give you more post-operative pain if you don't have that well managed. There's also great alternatives and there's new drugs out there like getting IV, acetaminophen, acetaminophen and things like that before your procedure that can help um, with those of us who have trouble tolerating uh, opioids and things like that. So there's strategies but you have to be thoughtful and you have to have those discussions with your doctor before you start. So preparing your home weeks before surgery. Every time I have surgery, I have a system. The month before surgery, I cook a lot. I cook almost every night. I double up my cooking, and then I freeze half. So when I have surgery, I'm not eating junk food when I'm recovering and pizza. So I have frozen meals for three weeks after surgery that people can just take out and defrost. Um, you can set up grocery deliveries. I make sure my meds are all filled and that I'm really set up to recover and rest as best as I can. I have three kids in a very busy household, so I want to set myself up for success and you need to set up childcare if you have children. Um, you want to obtain any equipment necessary like braces, splints, crutches, a head, and inform your medical team that you're having the surgery. If you deal with anxiety, um, which everybody does usually about surgery, have your toolkit ready, like bring in your headphones and you know get your grounding techniques together, and alert your surgeon and your pre-op nurse if you get sick within you know that last week before surgery. If you start to feel feverish, if you have a cough, call them and let them know. What's special about us? Because we are special people. Things you should uh, be aware of um, and make sure that your team, this is why your team needs to know about your disorders. So people, especially with connective tissue disorders, your airway may be lax. Interestingly enough, so there's different levels of anesthesia. The tube down the throat, the intubation, that doesn't always happen. But I had horrible sleep apnea. Everybody in my family has sleep apnea. I had horrible sleep apnea as a, a child and as a teenager. And the first time I was intubated, it, I woke up the next day in the hospital and I no longer snored. And I haven't snored since. Um, I, don't, I can't explain it. I can only imagine that there was some kind of an airway obstruction or something that was cleared by the intubation process. Um, and so with connective tissue disorders, there's still a lot we don't know. And um, we also have a lot of people in, in my area that have hyoid issues um, and subluxations. So um, there may need to be a different way that you're tubed or approached, and um, there, are, there are tools to do that. So this is why um, your provider needs to be aware of that. And um, if you're like me and you're fused from cervical instability, um, you can't move your head. Um, with full range of motion, your anesthesiologist needs to know that. You need to tell them that. I have cervical fusions, and you need to know where your fusions are. It matters, okay? So um, you want to talk about that, but we also have, of course, tissue fragility, thermal regulation issues. ORs are cold. They're cold for a reason. We don't want bacteria growing in there, but I come out shivering and shaking and in the PACU we're assessing your temperature regulation to look for malignant hyperthermia so I get extra blankets I get fluid uh, boluses before I go in because my blood pressure bottoms out so there are strategic ways to deal with these things and I do really well with surgery I've never had any problems because I know and I talk to my team ahead how to manage it so the worst thing that happens is I stay an extra day and get some extra fluids that's not the worst thing that can happen with my medical history, for sure. So uh, periods of apnea, TMJ laxity, or, or um, issues that we might have with our jaws, these are all things, sorry, that you want to let the anesthesia know so they can be careful of your jaw and not give you a big flare-up. Um, and the way that local anesthetics affect a lot of us. So some of us don't respond to lidocaine and, and some cane drugs. But we do blocks in pre-op a lot, so we block an area to try to reduce the need for the anesthesia load that we put on a patient. So we might say, block you locally in your foot or your hand or your shoulder, and that's supposed to work. It may not work on us, um, or it may have a delayed effect, like at the dentist office. If they wait an extra 10 minutes, it might work but they're not patient. So you might say, can you give me my block 20 minutes earlier than scheduled and see if it will have a better effect? 
It may or may not. But these are things that they should uh, consider when they're treating you. And we have neuropathic pain, de delayed wound healing, blood pressure, craziness, heart rate craziness. Deconditioning can escalate in our population. Um, so we want to make sure that we're moving and we're upright as much as possible in the recovery process and that we have more allergic reactions um, than the average bears. So be careful with sutures. Um, so sutures are interesting because we also scar. My, my youngest son, I, had to I was the only one that could remove sutures from uh, a really deep cut he had once. Um, we, it, was, it was bad. He scarred so badly over the sutures, they left him in extra long, and it was mattress sutures that were really deep. But he scarred over them um, really bad. So we say leave them in a little bit longer, but watch the scarring, because if you leave them too long, you could end up having another procedure to get the sutures out. So if you can use dissolvable sutures and, and you don't react to them, I recommend it. Staples um, are easier to pull out if you scar over them in sutures, but there's just some things to consider if you have issues in that way. And um, of course, abnormal scarring and unusual bruising. Don't blame the doctor, it's probably you. Um, try not to blame the physicians. They really do try to do a good job. So, you know, effective communication, patient to provider and provider to provider communication is super important, of course, always, but especially in the pre-op and post-operative process. Introduce one caregiver as your point person, not a whole team, okay? These doctors have a lot of patients. We're lucky if they can remember us. They're not gonna remember everybody. Just pick your one person. Ideally, it would be the person that um, is your care partner and your person that would be on your advanced directives. So it doesn't confuse the doctor that he would have to go to somebody else if there was an emergency situation while you were under anesthesia or in recovery. Um, and then prepared patients have better outcomes, right? So do your best to prepare. You, <laughs> Follow the instructions that you're given after the surgery. You know, in general, if you listen and, and do what you're told and don't do crazy things like stick pencils down your cast and, and jam, you know, things down there, you're, you're probably going to do okay. But a lot of post-operative infections are very preventable. People get curious. You know, they want to take pictures and they open things. Don't do that. <laughs> Okay, and then they say the doctor or the facility was, that OR was dirty. No, you jammed a pencil that was at the bottom of your pocketbook for six years into your operative site. Be a good patient. We love good patients. And you're gonna, you, just be patient. You're gonna see that gross wound in like three days. But if the doctor puts a dressing on, don't take it off until you're supposed to. Here's the other challenge is you're gonna get a bunch of stuff in writing and you're gonna be under anesthesia. So the person that's with you is going to take that paperwork, if he's anything like my husband, and shove it in the visor in the car, and you don't even remember you have it. So when you get alert the next day, make sure you get that in writing and um, you review it because you won't remember. So go over things, it'll have all your stuff written down, take your medication as prescribed, follow your directions, and be a good patient. But real, be realistic about your pain control. You're going to have pain after surgery. It's not permanent pain, so just be aware of that. And most importantly, this is what I really want to stress. Um, Kim is a, a nurse that volunteers with us. Kim and I did a Twitter chat about this yesterday. I think one of the biggest um, concerns about our community right now is that we see patients dismissing um, urgent um, symptoms as our body drama, right? Stuff that, symptoms that we go through, um, they're not reporting. So if you have an abnormal symptom after surgery, you need to report it to your team. Don't dismiss it as regular um, issues related to your connective tissue disorder because you could be having, you know, a pulmonary embolism or a blood clot or something like that. So always report changes in your health afterwards to the appropriate person and please don't dismiss it because we care about you and want you to be safe. Okay, so if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. That's it. Thank you so much.